This is going to be a, a bit of a long story. I'm going to split it into two parts. One is going to be the story of World War II in Europe, the build-up to the World War II in Europe and the war in Europe and American involvement. And then I'll do another part that's about the, the, uh, the war in the Pacific because each one of them are just too large to put into one, one presentation. To understand World War II, you have to go back to the end of World War I, and in particular to the Versailles Treaty, which was satisfactory to almost no one, and in particular unsatisfactory to the Germans. And you have to, you have to understand that during the 20s and the 1930s, the failure of the United States to join the League of Nations created great consternation and uh, amongst Americans, and also a failure to understand that after World War I, the United States could no longer just withdraw from international politics. It was the most powerful economic um, country on the planet. It had international relations and economic relations and cultural relations because of the millions of immigrants from all over the world. But many Americans still felt that they could live in an isolated uh, world uh, and ignore what was going on in the rest of the world. I put some dates down here. Uh, we'll get, you can slow this down and, and look at these dates in particular, but I want to start the story from here. In World War I, eight million men died in the fighting and another 7 million disabled and 15 million seriously injured and 17 million died and a flu epidemic in which even one of my uncles died at two years old from 1918, 1919 and 50 million casualties, half of them in Russia. That kind of history, 1914 to 1918, has a, a tremendous impact on all the history that comes after it. They said, they, the, the people uh, who write history books, it's the war to end all wars, which we know is stupid. Man will always figure out some way to have another war, one way or another. Uh, it's not the war to end all wars. But this is what really influences the 20th century. One of the major impacts was the Bolshevik Revolution. It was not a revolution of the Russian people against the Tsar. It was a small political group. In the spring of 1917, a group called the Mensheviks uh, took over the power in Leningrad, excuse me, St. Petersburg, then and today. Um, but it didn't last long. They, they couldn't, the, the Tsar had to resign. They took him and his family off to Ekaterinburg, where in 1918 they were murdered in cold blood. And then in October of 1917, a small group of socialists led by Vladimir Ilyevich Lenin took over power. There was just simply no concentrated opposition, so they took over power. When they did that, the rise of socialism, the rise of, of a communist state, an anti-capitalist state, begins to be a seed of fear in the capitalist democratic countries of Western Europe and North America and around the world because communism was so vocally opposed to the abuses of capitalism and industrialism and monopolies, etc., etc. We've been through it. In 1919 and 1921, the United States, Great Britain, uh, Japan, other de democratic countries got together and actually invaded Russia, the Soviet Union, from the east and also from the north, trying to overthrow this Bolshevik revolution. The Bolsheviks were fighting a civil war with the white armies who, were, who supported the, the Tsar or the Tsar's descendants, and then they lost, 
I don't think anybody understands how large the Soviet Union or Russia is. And I have, I have studied this in great detail, even taking two trips to the Soviet Union back in the late 1970s and going by train from Moscow all the way across Siberia, the Trans-Siberian Railroad to Novosibirsk in Irkutsk, down to Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia on one trip, and then all the way to Vladivostok on the Pacific Ocean. It's like 10 time zones. It's an immense, immense, immense country, and there's nothing out there. The so Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, the USSR, is created. Lenin dies in 1924. Stalin takes over. Lenin's last wish was, don't let Stalin take over. That didn't work. The rise of the Soviet Union, Stalin wants to modernize. So you've got this threat in the largest country in the world, this monstrous threat of a monster called communism. And communism in those days was not the, the devil as we later think about it as promoted by democratic, so-called democratic, fully democratic, and right-wing dictatorships. No one really knew what was going on inside the Soviet Union because it was a closed totalitarian state where some people went there, but they fooled them. We're on a five-year plan. We're going to industrialize. We're going to modernize the Soviet Union and create a great country. Well, Stalin, in the bottom line is, Stalin was the greatest murderer of all the 20th century. Stalin made Hitler look almost amateurish in how he handled things. In 1938, the Germans and the Nazis the Germans and the, excuse me, the Germans and, and, the, and the Russians even signed treaties with each other, although they both hated each other. There were three powerful discontented nations on the march in the 1930s. Germany, Italy, and Japan. Russia at that time was trying to consolidate its own power. But eventually you end up with a Russian Soviet totalitarian dictatorship. You end up with a German totalitarian dictatorship by 1939. You end up with a Japanese authoritarian dictatorship controlled by the military. You end up with an Italian uh, authoritarian dictatorship, a Spanish authoritarian dictatorship. All of this in the 1930s. Most of it, you could say, rising from the discontent of, the, of countries, of the modern industrial world, but the discontent with the failures of capitalism. The Americans are isolated. The Americans, uh, we don't want anything to do with it. They're greatly influenced by such literature. I remember reading All Quiet on the Western Front, reading uh, Ernest Hemingway, for whom the bells toll, the tragedies uh, of World War I are in people's minds, and they don't want anything to do with it. You look at, uh, Americans don't want to be in the military. You don't, people don't want, uh, my father joined the army in 1938, but he did it because of the depression, and because, as he said, I was hungry. It was really funny. Uh, the first place he went when he joined the army as a 17-year-old boy who got his mommy to sign that he was 18, he went to Cooks and Baker School, and I asked him one time, why did you do that? Because during the war, he became a, a captain and highly, highly decorated with silver stars and bronze stars and purple hearts for being wounded in battle and all kinds of things. But he said, <coughs> he said, the reason I went to Cooks and Baker School is that's where the food was, and I was hungry. He never had a cookie in his whole young life. They were raised in poverty, abject poverty. So in the 1930s, Hitler's creating this totalitarian dictatorship. Stalin's on the other side of the, the red line. 
and you can see through some of the, the pictures here what a totalitarian state looks like. The whole, if you look in the upper right hand corner, it's called the Reichstag, raising their hands on the order from Hitler. You may see similarities somewhere. Sometimes I think the United States needs one of those because they can't raise their hands all at one time and agree on a budget. And you can see the, the order of a totalitarian dictatorship. If you look in the upper left-hand corner where it says Auschwitz entrance, I've been to Auschwitz and Dachau. The, the thing across the top says Arbeit macht frei means work will make you free. Extremely cynical remark. The United States returned to isolism, isolationism. They increased tariffs to protect U.S. manufacturers. That never works. It's never worked, and it never will work. A country cannot, people, it, particularly in today's world, where we have some protectionist uh, laws here in Ecuador trying to block imports, but to supposedly protect Ecuadorian manufacturers and artisans, it doesn't work because the other countries who want to sell their stuff worldwide, they'll block yours. You know, you've got to have an open, free market world, particularly in this, in this particular century, but even in the last century. And then the, the Americans, the United States in the 1920s, cut off all immigration, the Great Depression, what, you can't even imagine what that does to the mentality, the psychology of the American people. Uh, uh, what's happening? In the late 1930s, Adolf Hitler, by, 19, uh, by September 1st of 1939, Hitler has created a new, German, a new Germany. Uh, the German national anthem is Deutschland über alles, means Germany over everyone. He was a master at propaganda. Uh, he had a propaganda minister, his name was Joseph Goebbels. And Goebbels said one time, the bigger the lie, the most often repeated, then it becomes truth. Control of all the press, newspapers, magazines, radio at that time, no TV, no internet, no tweeters, no twits, no nothing. The government controls all information to all people. The government uh, red creates a regimen, regimentation. The government creates jobs by, by building, if anyone's ever been to Germany, you drive on super highways that were designed and built back in those days, mostly to move the military from one place to another, but it put a lot of people to work. So Hitler ends unemployment. Anyone who opposes his government, then 1933, and Hitler becomes the chancellor, by the summer of 1933, he creates the first concentration camp. And there's a difference between a concentration camp and a death camp, like Auschwitz. Auschwitz, Auschwitz in Polish, was created as a, an industry, industry camp where the people were slave laborers, but many were sent straight from the trains into the, cremat into the gas chambers and then to the crematoriums. But that didn't happen until about after uh, January of 1942. There was a meeting, I'll, I'll, I'll mention it again in a minute, at a place called Wansi. And there's a great movie, a very disturbing movie on uh, YouTube. It's called The Conspiracy. You might want to watch that if you're at all interested in this. I've watched it many times, and every time I sit there with my mouth open, not believing what the discussion's about, you can find out for yourself. It's amazing. Oh, and it's true. How can we eliminate all Jews from Europe? Now, but that was in 1942. But four years earlier, Hitler has recreated the German army, the German Air Force called the Luftwaffe, the German Navy, Army, Air Force, submarines, fighter planes, bombers. The thing is, what are you going to do with all this stuff? He's recreated the pride of the German people. And if you know anything about Germans, you know that they are very prideful people, sometimes to a fault. 
the industries of the Krupp family, the most massive steel manufacturers, guns beyond imagination, huge battleships, submarines, everything you need for war. So you've got to have a war. And Hitler's theory was, or his, uh, his preaching, his religion was, it's called, in German, it's called Lebensraum, which means uh, they need living room. Where do you need living room? Well, those people east of Germany, if you look at a map, you look down, you see uh, Poland, uh, Czech Republic, today the Czech Republic and Slovak Republic used to be Czechoslovakia. You see below that is Hungary, all of those people further south, Romania, Bulgaria, those people like Russians, Ukrainians, Belarus, those are Slavic people. So we, the German people, uh, we're going to take over these places and we need, Hitler's got to do something. He's got a lot of guns and you just can't sit on it like a sword. So when World War II begins, when Hitler attacks Poland on September 1st, 1939, and I marked my little guys here, I have made a lifetime study of World War II. Seriously. My first book I ever read was uh, about 11 or 12 years old, and it was about a British fighter pilot. His name was John E. Johnson. I never forgot it, in the Battle of Britain. But here you see Joseph Goebbels on the left, Himmler in the black uniform. He was in charge of the SS, the Schutzstaffel. Hess has another whole story, and then there's Hitler, and on the right is Jules Stryker. They were all super nationalists. World War II, the Axis was Germany, Italy, and Japan. In World War II, the Allies were Great Britain, France, the Soviet Union, the United States, and China, which really had not much power at all. And you see in the picture, the guy on the left is Benito Mussolini. He's a whole study by himself, too. Hitler attacks the Soviet Union on June 22, 1941, and now Stalin is an ally with Great Britain, Winston Churchill, and the United States against Hitler. They all realized that they had to defeat Germany first. Italy was inconsequential. Spain stayed out of the Second World War. Uh, but, and Japan, by December 7, 1941, was in the Second World War. But Hitler was considered to be the danger to everyone. And I think, you, I think it's right. The in Germans invaded the Soviet Union, the largest land invasion, millions of German soldiers moving to the east from 19, in 1942, 1941, excuse me. The United States becomes the greatest industrial nation in the world. Tanks, trucks, fighter planes, bombers, airplanes, transportation planes, boots, pants, shirts, helmets, uh, guns, rifles, machine guns, ships, they were turning out a ship a day by 1944. The largest navy in the history of mankind by 1945. The first superhighways, and we'll deal with this when we get to the 1950s. Super high, if you've been to the United States, I think one of the first impressions a lot of my Ecuadorian students have said was, I-95, right out of the Miami airport, there's a super highway, and it goes all the way to the Canadian border, and you can go all the way from Boston to San Francisco and Los Angeles on other I-90s all the way across the nation. All of these things, this explosive industrialization and of the economy of the American the United States itself because of World War II. There is no more depression. Everybody goes to work. You either go in the military or you go into the factories. All the women now leave the homes and go into the military and go into the factory. My mother, my, like I said, my father went in the army as a, as a young boy. By 1942, he was in the 82nd Airborne Division, the first paratrooper division of the United States Army. By 1945, he was a captain, having jumped uh, jumping in combat is an, is an unusual experience. Jumped in Sicily, Italy, D-Day, the 6th of June, 1945, uh, if you ever saw the movie Saving Private Ryan. And another great movie, you, I think you can get the whole thing on YouTube, it's called A Bridge Too Far, which is about a battle for some bridges over the Rhine. He jumped four times 
He has four purple hearts. I have them on a thing right in front of me. The Allies of the Grand, I put this here, Winston Churchill on the right, one of the most fascinating characters, not only of the 20th century, but of history. And then on the left is Franklin Roosevelt, and on the bottom is Mr. Truman, and Stalin, as I said, really bad guy. But he was an ally. Churchill, I think, said, I would make an alliance with the devil if we could beat Hitler. And he considered Stalin to be the devil. The bad guys, the really bad guys, was the one in the middle and the one on the lower left. The one on the lower left is Heinrich Himmler. You'll notice on the top of his helmet, his hat is the death's head of the Schutzstaffel. They were the ones that went into Poland and would round up people in every little town and take them out into the forest and just shoot everybody in the back or the head or whatever. And of course, the really pompous looking guy in the upper left, pardon me because some people have Italian names, but a very pompous Italian man named Benito Mussolini, mostly show, not much in the battlefield. December 7th, 1941, Japan attacks the United States in a undeclared attack, and it was, it is, you're supposed to declare war and then you attack. The Japanese didn't. The Japanese were warned by the commander of the Japanese Navy. His name was uh, Yamamoto, Admiral Yamamoto, who had studied at Harvard University and I think Northwestern University in Chicago. And he said, I have seen the economic, the industrial power of the United States. We should not attack the United States. There are many reasons why the Japanese attacked the United States, but it was, he said that they could run wild for six months. But by then the Americans would have recuperated from this great shock, this attack on Pearl Harbor, and then Japan could not win a war with the United States, but no one would listen to him. The Japanese were full of military uh, bravado is the word, I, word, I think. Because by J June of 1942, and I'll deal with this in another one about the Pacific War, the Americans destroyed the Japanese Navy at the Battle of Midway. At the same time, December of 1942, by then, there's a wonderful, wonderful movie. It's called Enemy at the Gates. And it's about the Battle of Stalingrad. I've, read, I've been to Stalingrad. I've read many books about the Battle of Stalingrad. It's unbelievable. It's uh, absolutely incredible what ba how that battle went on. All battles are pretty horrible. I've had mine, but nothing like Stalingrad. The battles in the Pacific on the islands were, were pretty grotesque also. I put Vasily Zaitsev at the bottom because in the movie, The Enemy at the Gates, he's the hero of the movie, a, a Russian sniper who shoots down the bad German guys and that kind of thing. Great movie. Really, really great movie. That might even be on YouTube also. By the spring of 1943, the Allies, the Americans and the British in North Africa, they defeat uh, the Germans at a battle called El Alamein. Uh, the Americans come into the war and into the European war by the spring of, well, by late 42, actually. And then they invade Sicily at the boot of, of Italy and move up. Now, at the same time that Stalingrad, millions Soviets dying there, Russian soldiers, million Ru German soldiers dying there, almost a million prisoners, freezing to death, dying. Stalin was screaming, please open a second front. This is very important in understanding World War II in Europe. The Americans and the British, please help us. The Rus and when you read Russian history books, and I have them actually on a bookcase in front of me, they don't mention the Americans or the British very much. They sacrifice so many Russians that that's what they talk about. The Russians defeated Germany. By World 6th of June 1944, the Americans and the British do open a second front and in Normandy on the north northwest coast of France. Uh, Saving Private Ryan is one of my favorite movies. I don't know how many times I've seen that movie. 
and they start moving eastward. The Russians are moving. By that time, the Russians are already in Poland, moving towards Berlin. And the war in, ends in April of 1945. Hitler commits suicide. Franklin Roosevelt died. Harry Truman is the president of the United States. And Germany uh, surrenders unconditionally. And I saw something recently where that sailor kissing that nurse, the nurse was just identified as an 88-year-old lady. The Holocaust was discovered. And that's something that's very hard to understand. Uh, having been to uh, Dachau and Buchenwald, Auschwitz, Bergen-Belsen, I'm a history student. That's, that's what I do when I go to Europe, part of it anyway. In October, I go to Munich and drink beer with the boys. Um, it's hard to understand. This, this, uh, you, you, even now, when you walk out, the bottom left-hand corner is the Auschwitz camp. You can walk out behind where the crematoriums are and you get, you get ashes on your shoes. Then you begin to realize what that is. The picture in the upper left-hand corner, when the Allies, and you see American troops in the background, they forced the German people who lived around to go through these concentration camps, these death camps, and see what your country, what your people, what your Germany, what your Hitler had done to people. And it's really hard to, it's hard to understand. Like I've been reading this many, many, many years. How many? 55 years at least. The Yalta Conference in January 1945, how are we going to, sep how are we going to end this war? They did. The Potsdam Conference in July of 45 was uh, a continuation of a discussion, but by then, if you look at the picture, you'll see Roosevelt in the middle. He's very, very sick in January of 45, and he dies in April. Truman is now the President of the United States. The question was how, and this, this plays directly into our next discussion about uh, how the Europe is going to be controlled and divided up. The Russians, they wanted to sterilize every German male and control all of Germany. And they wanted reparations. They wanted to really crush Germans. Which if you read, when you read the history, you can't blame them. The Germans had murdered millions of, of Russians over in, in the 20th century already by 1945. So the war ends. The, the people are put on trial. This is the picture of the Nuremberg trials, crimes against humanity. The top living Germans were put on trial. Uh, the guy in the lower left, I can't do it with my mouse, with, in the front lower left is Hermann Goering. Next to him is Hess. Goering committed suicide. Hess went to prison for 20 years. It was the first time that they had trials. And I put the little picture at the bottom left-hand corner of the mass Nazi rallies and Heil Hitlers and everything, and that's how it all ended up. Crimes against humanity.